Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to beautiful Lisbon on my time. Um, I will so take you a bit from the digital world into the world of theater and then come back to the digital worlds. Um, because, well, just three words about myself. My background is actually the first job I had when I left school was journalist. So the intention to talk about realities out there remains, it's much stronger the, than the urge to talk about or to create fictions um, as they were uh, the normal language in theatre when I started at least. So a lot of our projects are documentary and try to use the theatre as a window to, th to topics that we want to talk um, outside of the theatre. Um, What's the lesson to theatre uh, by the internet, the lessons of uh, digital technologies? One might be that we use digital technologies in many of our projects, but I think the first and most important one is that theatre has always been a place where people had a top-down approach in its essential strategy. People up on the stage know things and try to communicate it to people that are sitting somewhere anonymously in the dark, a one-way channel. And as we've seen developing journalism, for instance, in a much more um, interactive uh, medium, I think theatre should take as a life medium this challenge um, and also become more horizontal. So, the first project I will show you some images about is actually also about climate change, as will be the one that you hopefully will see later in the afternoon in the Martin Museum. Um, we tried some time ago to uh, transform a uh, the, the biggest uh, theater in Germany, the Deutsche Schauspielhaus, into a World Climate Conference. The World Climate Conference at the time was not some, a place that was easy to communicate about in journalism. Um, because they, everybody, the journalists told me, oh, the topic is kind of over. But we felt that the complexity of this conference that then later, one year after this event, there was the Paris conference happening, has something quite impressive because the attempt of an organization like the UN solving that issue in a democratic way um, is, 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 is worth looking at in a time where the private companies take over. So when you saw this piece, you were not just sitting in the dark. When you come into the uh, into the theater, you're giving a niche, a national kind of, uh, what do you call it, badge. Um, and you immediately start to belong to a um, delegation yourself. But if you're Saudi Arabia, do you know enough about Saudi Arabia? So we created, together with the Max Planck Institute, Institute in Hamburg, um, these little booklets. Sie sind nicht hier als normaler Hamburger Zuschauer in einem Theaterstück, sondern Sie sind heute Teil von 196 Delegationen in dieser Weltklimakonferenz. Die erste COP war 95 in Berlin bei den Kollegen aus Deutschland. Wo sind die heute Abend? Da hinten, vielen Dank. Deutschland war eben grundsätzlich sehr aktiv in, den, in der Klimaverhandlung, hat eben damals auch die erste COP nicht weit von hier in Berlin ausgerichtet. Wir stehen vor der Herausforderung, mit allen Delegationen hier im Saal eine Lösung zu erzielen. Und die Weltgemeinschaft hat sich geeinigt, mehr als zwei Grad ist gefährlich. Wenn wir weiter wachsen, mehr Menschen werden, mehr Technik haben, mehr Energie brauchen, dann sehen wir, dass wir einfach immer weiter pro Jahr mehr Tonnen CO2 emittieren werden. Wir sehen gleichzeitig so einen blauen Schlauch. Das ist das, was die Wissenschaft gesagt hat, was kompatibel wäre mit einer Erwärmung der Welt, die nicht über zwei Grad hinausgeht. Das geht so nicht mit Business as usual. Das heißt, es geht um Emissionsreduktionen. Und das bringt uns... So, Ihre Aufgaben. Recht ist so ein Zettel, den hat nur eine Person pro Delegation bei Ihnen. Sie können ja mal gucken, wer das bei Ihnen in der Delegation ist, denn diese Person ist ab jetzt Delegationsleiter. Also Sie können das ja mal kurz identifizieren, wer bei Ihnen der Chef in der Delegation ist. 
So, as you see, people in this uh, audience, uh, although there are more than 600, we try to individually target them in a way. Um, that's one lesson by, uh, from digital uh, cultures, that the user is not an anonymous, anonymous uh, part of an anonymous crowd in the darkness. And in, able, in order to do that, we needed to complexify the space as well for a complex uh, topic. So, on one hand, you start to belong to this delegation, but then uh, later you also, because you have this mission, he will then explain that uh, you, have, you have to decide for your country how much do you lower, um, or what, what's your promise, as the, the delegation had to promise in Paris, how much CO2 will you reduce until 2020, how much until 2050, and how much will you contribute to the Green Climate Fund. Um, in order to uh, find out about how, what, what, how to do it, because obviously naively an audience that is probably half of them left wing at least, uh, will say, well, I'll just reduce it 100% for my country, Nigeria. But if you go back as a minister to Nigeria with that uh, decision, I'm not sure you keep your job. So to, to get closer to reality was one aim, and for this we had some experts. Von diesen 18 Experten sollte am ihre Aufgabe herausfinden, was ihr Land bereit ist zu geben. Wir werden das am Ende dann auch noch mal diskutieren gemeinsam, ob das reichen würde oder nicht. Dann haben Sie auch einen Zeitplan auf der ersten Seite. Das ist die Agenda. Wir zeigen Ihnen auch mal wieder für Belgien. Das ist Da müssen Sie heute Abend sehr oft drauf gucken und da müssen Sie sich sehr genau dran halten. Wir haben nicht nur den Raum hier, sondern wir tagen in sieben Räumen gleichzeitig den Rest des Abends. Wir sind jetzt gerade hier am Anfang im Saal, dann gibt es drei Blöcke und dann sind wir am Ende nochmal wieder hier. So basically these are the six spaces uh, we used in the theater, not centrally, only in the very beginning. Um, yeah, here, Saal, uh, the conference room. Um, which is the theater, uh, transformed with these little flags where the delegations are sitting. Um, but then, if you were Canada, you would be uh, going to North um, America, somewhere there, behind, backstage, whereas your colleagues um, from Nigeria would then be with Africa somewhere else. Later you go to maybe a bus driving around the theater, because you will be together with all the other countries that are considered concerned by the melting of glaciers. So you would be with Switzerland and Austria, maybe. Um, and later you get strategical advisory or consultancy by uh, politicians that had been working in real climate conferences themselves. So they're not actors, they're experts of their, um, of, of, of their sciences. Wo Sie zu einer bestimmten Zeit zu sein haben, das sehen Sie in Ihrem Plan. Da müssen Sie bitte wirklich darauf achten und versuchen, sich dran zu halten. Die Zeiten, die da draufstehen, werden exakt eingehalten. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, verehrte Delegationen, ich wünsche Ihnen und uns allen viel Erfolg in den nächsten Stunden. Hiermit erkläre ich die Weltklimakonferenz 2014 für eröffnet. So then you start walking around the building. The timing allowed only, I think, 10 minutes to walk around. There's something beautiful about you walking around with the Saudi Arabia sign around your head because obviously it creates a social warmth as well inside the building when you meet people that you know and uh, you are uh, United States. Why are you going to pull out of the agreement since Trump is in? power and you would start to have a maybe funny but in the same uh, playful maybe theatrical but in the same more, more connected to reality discourse so one session for instance started then for the middle east people in the bus um, and have the side so the bus was driving along an area where actually the Middle East has left its footpath in Und zwar wird Russland relativ stark getroffen sein vom Klimawandel, aber in erster Linie wohl, so geht es uns davon aus, positiv. 
Aktuell ist es gerade so, dass Russland seine Machtstellung doch wieder weiter versucht auszubauen. So, this is one closed session for all the Middle Eastern groups, which will obviously in a political process always look at each other and try to find common solutions. Um, in the behind the iron curtain of the theater, uh, we had a more complex setup. There we had two different briefing groups in the same space, one of them using headphones and laying on this revolving stage, um, being in the African delegations, whereas the other ones that we're listening to now are the European delegations. The European Mitbürger Europas stehen an dem Schau nach Norden. Es wird sehr schön warm, auch in Norden, beim Schwing. Wir können Kartoffeln anbauen. Vielleicht ähm, stehen wir einfach mal auf als Gewinner sozusagen ähm, des Klimawandels, wo ist Norden? And while he is talking to the Swedish delegation, um, the others are listening to a Nigerian a delega, um, expert um, talking from the top of this about weather conditions and showing them very concretely on this stage. So part of these, our stagings, it is obviously to, to transmit complex topics, but uh, another part of it is also to try to make them more than information, because when I was working as a journalist, I was a bit frustrated often by doing a lot of research, then decomplexifying them into 100 lines. Next day people would read it and think it's the truth, what we're actually was often quite subjective impressions as well and the day afterwards people would throw it away. With our staging we often try to have a more sustainable or longer enduring um, experience that is hopefully leaving traces for longer in your memory. In the end we collected, um, oops, that was too fast, uh, all the little papers that people had to fill out in the beginning about those three decisions for their delegations and then we had a computer program calculating the outcome what would, if we were the Paris um, conference, what would be the future of the planet then? That was now actually from the experts, now it's just about what they have done. Which countries want to reduce the most in 2020? Am meisten reduzieren bis 2020 wollte Bolivien mit 65 Prozent. Ja, vielen Dank. Maybe not so realistic. Children seem to be more uh, generous in terms of the future of their planet. Ein ambitioniertes Reduktionsziel, wenn man davon ausgeht, dass da jetzt ja nur noch sechs Jahre Zeit für sind. And Evo Morales is not such a climate protector. Sehr viel Erfolg dabei. Die Frage ist, wenn wir jetzt alle but when we looked at the overall results, counting them together, um, so it wasn't actually so different. Um, our result from what came out in the end one year, one year later in Paris. 2050. Das ist die größere Frage. Wie wollen wir langfristig die Weltgesellschaft umstellen werden? Ja, yeah, so basically we had a number of evaluations, um, which would obviously be different in every evening, according to sometimes we had a lot of school classes, they would vote differently. Sometimes um, on the corridors where most political decisions are taken in such uh, conferences, obviously certain butterfly effects started to influence uh, each other, so it really did, in a way, depend on the people that were there, out of the darkness of the audience space. <laughs> I thought, or we discussed before, that if you have very concrete questions about certain projects, um, you might just come in and we won't wait till the end. Um, so that's your chance for the World Climate Conference. If not, I go on and talk about a project where we uh, were 
also trying to tackle a complex uh, topic and bring it somehow into your body. Germany is the biggest, um, third biggest uh, weapon exporter in the world, and um, nevertheless, Germany often behaves as if they would be a, a place of very much reason and without war, far from everything. And this complex topic, uh, weapon trafficking, we tried some years ago to uh, to dive into it by making visible not only one side, which you can regulate from the government, uh, where you export weapons to, where not to, or not only through national um, legislation uh, involved, but looking at 20 different biographies that are shaped by weapon trafficking. Um, so we had a long phase, uh, it was about one year long research to find protagonists that could talk by, from their experience about the production of weapon, the use of weapon, the, um, and the effects of it as well. The most easy was obviously to find people from NGOs and the international politicians that would say we're against weapon. But we also thought it's very important to have people that do produce um, themselves, um, weapon manufacturers. We got turned down by many German weapon manufacturers that didn't want to talk in public, but we found some in Switzerland that were not so shy to talk about it. Um, and the way the project uh, developed was that we created a number of spaces uh, according, or the set designer Dominic Cooper actually created them, um, following uh, the real spaces where these people work in, as soldiers, as trainees, as doctors without borders, as uh, victims, refugees uh, that had run away from a place. This Places were built into a building about the size of this space, just a bit higher. Um, and you walk into it, uh, you don't meet the people themselves, but you kind of step into their shoes. As you can see here, the audience person here has an iPad in his hand. Uh, these are, this is the hands of the spectator. But on the screen, he sees uh, the hands of, in this case, a German uh, police trainer um, of the special forces. And he himself, again, holds a gun in his hand. And they're standing in the same space, or where he stood, because he filmed uh, in this space, whereas the audience then takes um, the iPad and follows him his steps, seeing his hands, seeing him opening the door, you kind of do the same thing throughout the building. How does this look? Okay, so these are our protagonists. I show you in the trailer. We had a Pakistani lawyer defending drone victims. We had a gunship pilot from India, a member of the Linke <coughs> Party. <coughs> Généraux, ils nous ramener aux frontières du Rwanda pour nous former être soldats. Et on y va se mettre une taille de mort. Puis, nous avons la haïté qu'on se taille. Nous avons fait des tailles de pénal sur les petits. Nous avons fait des tailles de pénal sur les petits. There is someone that actually wants to keep it. So these spaces um, that the Kuba created, they are altogether transportable. Uh, you saw it in Bochum, um, but as we're speaking, it's being transported to Moscow, where shows are happening in two weeks of this project. And it looks very, very realistic, up to the point that one of the weapon producers uh, whose office we replicated in, or we copied into this space, he always in the 
uh, when, when we didn't shoot the film, he was sitting down and starting to work and kind of forgot that his secretary is not sitting outside. Um, the audience also is meant to interact, and this happens through a very specific uh, form of shooting these films, because the 20 films were shot exactly in the same moment. That means each one of the 20 spectators would start from one perspective. One would be the weapon seller, the other one would be the refugee, the other one would be the soldier. And after seven minutes, you swap identity. You're asked even to interact in ways as you can see. Look at the mirror. I'm a hacker. <coughs> now I have another pseudo body, which is yours. Walk over to him and say hello. Ujambo, what is that? Sasari and Bia. If I was so to Jimmy and Hopkins, to Joe, and Nas, I said, it's a young little. Yeah, it's always a bit difficult for me to explain this project because the more immersive these kind of works get, the more, the less uh, possible it is to film it from outside so that you have an idea of it, what it is. People seeing the trailer, uh, sometimes we had the experience that people that normally do first-person shooter games came and kind of felt that it is a similar experience, which totally is somehow the contrary experience, because you're not shooting at all, you're kind of having a reflection on it. But the, the strategy of being kind of aiming, in this case not with a uh, gun or not with a camera but with an iPad where a recording is on it to, to make the images of reality match the images of the capture obviously was 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 well working with the, the topic. Maybe you should say something about your experience seeing it. Well, oh. It was traumatic at times, especially the, the scene with the um, when you when you look at your body or parent body and it's wounded. Mm -hmm. You're lying on a scratcher. So I thought it was truly uh, an interface experience for me. I thought it was one of the strongest experiences I had for theater, actually. And in Bochum, uh, it, it was also the change of perspective, I thought, was also quite uh, um, challenging. Um, because when you sort of change the perspective, uh, the, the change of perspective at once showed that you were playing a role, so that there was a limit to the immersive experience, right? And it forced you again to start anew. And this starting all over again, I thought was also mm -hmm. very interesting. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the point is that to whomever you listen to in this field of weapon trafficking, you start to identify and you start to understand his point of view, but then you swap the identity and you realize that from the child soldier point of view, the argument of the, the, the pacifist might look up naive and the argument of the weapon deliverer might be a different one. So it, it really kind of uh, makes you jump very fast from one side to another. I think there were other people. Oh, yeah. Anybody wants to comment or ask a question about this yes, one? Yeah. Yes, Adrian. Yeah. I, uh, I just, I just recognized the experience and um, it was really uh, impressive um, because 
we had that idea of being in a closet uh, space from where we could not uh, leave. So somehow we were obliged to have that experience. And uh, um, that was the idea of wearing someone else's shoes. So mm -hmm. it was really interesting. Yeah, we had actually one person in Hamburg once uh, who, after five minutes, came out of the building and said, I don't want to be a weapon manufacturer, not even for five minutes. And so close it seems to come to him, a bit threatening in that sense. The other complexity of the project is the script being a total, so this is our script. Uh, from minute zero to minute, well, the next page is missing, minute seven. Um, and so basically you go first as the chief of protocol through the experience and then you go, mm, then, mm. and wherever you see the same color there is an interaction so the filming of this whole thing was uh, a very complicated <laughs> thing because we had to be outside because everything that happened inside the building while the shooting was happening would be on the camera so we were training again and again and again people that are in their everyday life soldiers or um, refugees or uh, to hold cameras to uh, follow a very precise um, protocol of time complex but it, it was uh, funny enough for the people a lot of people felt that it's augmented reality but talking about technology, it's totally not. It, it was shot, really, the whole thing was shot in seven minutes only, after a phase of two years of preparation, and now it's there, and it doesn't digitally change at all. The world changes, but unfortunately, the wars we talk about haven't really disappeared. Um, in a more complex technological way, we were trying to tackle the, the questions of um, the intelligence industry last year or year, a year ago um, in a project called Top Secret International where we talked with people who work for secret services in the, or who have been victims of or were writing about them or were whistle whistleblowers or were politicians that have to try to control them and again we wanted it to be an experience that um, gives something physical as an experience to you as well so we decided and we knew that these people need by definition to stay hidden and wouldn't be uh, wanting to show us their face. So we only worked with their voices. And we decided to bring these voices to a place that is a place of high culture, a museum. In this case, it was the Glyphothek in Munich. And when you came, you uh, receive a headphone and you have to just quickly press OK on a number of questions. Are you OK to be wearing We are all headphone? ready. Go into the next room. The room with the boy and the boots. Find a quiet place to sit down. You are in the Glitcho taken Munich in room number 13. The system has identified your position. You need to get to know your legend first. That's what we in the intelligence call a role that is tailor-made for you so that you can perform your true mission undercover. By all appearances, you are a perfectly normal museum visitor. You do what people do in museums. You walk around. You look at the exhibits. You learn about their history and listen to background information about them on your audio guide. You make your observations. But actually, you're here to learn something about something whose nature is invisible. It's as old as the items being conserved and on exhibit here. They say that it's the world's second oldest profession. But now it's time for you to walk around the boy with the goose. Is this a game or a battle? How would this story have ended if it hadn't been frozen in time? In a moment you will enter the network of intelligence with your body. Unlike these sculptures, you can move your body. I am going to locate you. So? Okay, now stroll slowly on 
into the next room. You will record, collect and analyse information without being noticed by those around you. You will be equipped with a single object, which for reasons of camouflage is a notebook. Use it like one. You moved. You're doing great. You are now in the don't room with Domitian in room number 12. His legs are missing from the knees down, and only one of his hands has been preserved. Look at him. In every room of this museum, there are documents. They're invisible, and only you can listen to them. Your presence in the room activates and plays them. Like Arvi Primor, right now. Arvi Primor was the Israeli ambassador in Germany for many years. He's ready to speak to you. Hello? Yeah. You ask him why nations have intelligence agencies. Well, let's put it like this. Wars have always been started when one side believed that it could win. If you believed that you would lose a war, you wouldn't be the one to start a war. And you wouldn't go to war either. So gradually you start uh, listening to these documents of people that we've interviewed in the course of these. Uh, again, it wasn't easy to find people. The ambassador was easy to identify, but not so easy to make him talk. But we also had people that really are still working for the BND, which is the Foreign Income Secret Service of Germany. Uh, that obviously we needed to change their names and so on. And, um, but they were willing, they were okay to do it. The people you see now in this film walking are, some of them, our audience, and they start not like in situation rooms in, in this synchronized way, they start each one on their own, but some of them are also just normal visitors of the museum. So the kind of suspicion about others, about how you move and how others move, um, was part of the, the, the experience, but then also, so partly the files were triggered by uh, what's called beacons. It's a Bluetooth kind of protocol to trigger, much like GPS, um, in the next room, the next file. But some of them were also asking you questions. And you would answer with this little notebook that you had in your hand. Question for you. If you have a person in front of you who knows the code to deactivate a bomb in a room with 50 people in it, would you resort to violence at the last minute in the hope of getting the code? If the answer is yes, hold the notebook vertically over your head on my signal. Ready? Now. Interesting. So, you would resort to violence. Walk into the corner room, room number 10, in order to possibly save the lives of other human beings. You have been in this whole long So day. our coders used the, I think it's the velocimeter or something, this thing that we have in our mobile fire phones allowing us to to to, look, to uh, use the, the, the placement of your mobile phone to, to, uh, to trigger certain things. We use this to gather information or to allow you to choose between different paths. So in this case, the in the beginning of the piece, the script uh, is kind of linear. You go into the next room, you have a file that is triggered, you choose the speed, but you don't choose where to go. If you go the wrong way, you hear this file, which is kind of sending you back. But then you start to kind of, through certain decisions, it becomes a little tree, and you have more and more options to choose from. It's not a total open world, as game coders would call that. It's still more close to the hit and run uh, game, the old strategy, Donkey Kong, that kind of stuff. Um, but it becomes more complex, especially on the next page, where you are asked to, I where another one of the players is suddenly identified to meet you after you being alone in your experience and not knowing who belongs to it, suddenly you meet somebody else. Go to the cafe. Here in the museum, you are watching other people who clearly belong to the same network as you do. They have also found many documents in these rooms. But you don't know which ones or how many. I'm going to share a contact with you now. 
and the contact will be informed about the meeting. The meeting will be arranged in the cafe. You are standing in the cafe again. You have an appointment here. Wait here for the key person who has been determined for you. Save a seat, if possible. You have time. The wait might be long. Just look around a while. I have determined a person. Be aware. The person who has been chosen as your key person is now in this room with you. Look around. Maybe you'll recognize them. Then as a sign, hold your notebook up with the arrow pointing upwards until it starts vibrating. Just to recognize. Your contact person will give you a sign by holding a notebook as if it were a telephone. <laughs> Respond to the greeting by stretching. <laughs> Sit with your contact, if you can. Sit next to each other, discreetly, if possible. But without speaking. Very discreetly. Do you still have that piece of paper where you wrote down what you were afraid of? Try to give it to your contact without arousing attention. Without speaking. Go ahead. Very discreetly. Your meeting will release another document. Very good. The meeting was registered. Our document will be released. Hello. This is Kai Bierman from Site Online. Oftentimes, when someone comes to meet me and wants to give me something, he's afraid of being discovered, observed. Of risking something. So, the funny thing is that as old uh, ancient game looking this kind of strategy is, uh, the guy who was, who was writing for Zeit Online and who actually was responsible for unveiling the scandal around Angela Merkel's um, mobile phone being um, surveilled by the Americans. Uh, he says that a lot of informants, he meets them in a very physical way, because obviously since Snowden times, we know whatever you do with your mobile phone, even close, might be subject to uh, people tapping uh, your, your, your conversations. So a lot of spy activities is uh, happening totally offline when it comes to it. To, whereas in the same moment, the experience um, or the, the research is something where we know that private companies now are much further and when Google needs to negotiate with the NSA what kind of data will they, will they release or not, it's talking more about the analysis of data. So this is the second part of our script, there it gets a bit more complex, where then in the end uh, the informations uh, that you kind of gave away by choosing things are played back at you and this happens after being on the toilet so we're going into the bit the less um, obvious places of the museum secretly financed and monitored by Iranian intelligence your work here is done stand up and go into the ante room but don't forget to flush yes leaving the bathroom store without flushing is very suspicious then go to the sink and wash your hands now you can risk a glance in the mirror. Could you see there? Don't forget, you're a perfectly normal museum visitor. You are just here for the exhibit. Now go back into the main hall, and then continue to the right, into the next room. Around the corner and to the left you'll find the grey door to the boiler room. Open the door. Go inside. Look at the screen more closely. Type in the password 656788. Without waking the screen up, then press enter. Now you are looking at the museum from above. Every face represents an information carrier. 
And this is when you find out why you had to say yes to a number of informations in the beginning, because when you did that on the computer, you there was taking a picture of you, and this picture then is displayed here of all the people who are the museum. During your research, during your research, you know, what is So here we were really trying to develop with, with programmers together a software to make this happen much similar in another project where we completely left these places of culture, the theaters in the first places, the museum in this case. Um, we made a project two years ago about Europe and we felt that the topic that is often too much talked about from the central headquarter in Brussels, people feel alienated from this place. So we decided this project should bring the discussion that we were interested in um, to a decentralized place. Um, so we went to the homes of people. Oh, this is still kind of our coding. So um, when you want to see this project, it also happened here in Lisbon, by, organized by Mayumatus Theatre. Um, you could invite it to your own home. That was one way to visit it. Then you can bring, uh, get free tickets for two friends of yours to come. Or um, if you uh, react later, or if, if you don't have a big enough table for 15 people to sit around, then you are communicated the address and you will find the day before the show happens or uh, you get the address and then you find this little note on the door of one address somewhere out in the city where one host is ho hosting this game and uh, half an hour before the show starts somebody from our team uh, comes to uh, unfold a tablecloth on the table that is a map of Europe where you gradually start to inscribe places where you've been, where you have family members, where you're somehow connected to within Europe. Um, and uh, somebody, an MC, a master of ceremony, kind of in explains the game and especially the little machine that is the soul uh, protagonist of this play where the people are at the center. Víte, jste na Evropě o vás doma, ne 28. listopadu 2015. Evropa u vás doma je divadelní hra, která se odehrává v pěti úrovních. Il tournera dans le sens des aiguilles du monde, dans ce sens-là. À chaque fois que vous entendrez une alarme, il faudra appuyer sur le bouton vert. Il va sortir un papier, une alarme, de cette impression-là, qui est la première partie. Nacházíme se v úrovni číslo jedna. V roku 1951 byla u stolu jako je tento založena montální unie. So tasks come out of this um, machine, some sounds come out of it, lights come out of it, papers with instructions. And uh, the later it goes, the more and more questions come out that kind of connect you to each other, but that also speak about yourself. And <laughs> so 
so these are places where these shows will have happened. So part of, partly we're using these informations to create a horizontal connection between the people um, that are taking part in this game in many different countries. But partly it also serves as information um, to get to know each other around the table to trigger conversations. And at some point, um, you are combined with other players according to how you behave in the first uh, part. Alors, vous êtes ensemble. Je vais vous donner parce que je vais vous donner un travail Et je vous écoute le très solidaire. Et vous ne travaillez pas en dehors du pays, vous ne vous êtes jamais battu. Euh, 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 voilà, donc voilà, entre autres les choses qui vous rejoignent à la vision. Vous serez l'équipe orange, vous vous en deux prendre place également. Bienvenue à tous les filles, ils sont ambitieuses. Vous êtes une équipe azul, noire, et c'est le pays jusqu'à nous. À partir de maintenant, les questions ont un timing. Donc, si vous ne répondez pas dans le temps, euh, vous pouvez inviter directement moins un point. Estimez combien d'argent liquide à chacun sur deux À peu près. So partly this is, one could argue, a game, and it's true that it's partly this. It is also partly a social event in a home, and it's also a conversation. I would say it's also a theatre piece, because theatre doesn't need to be something that is frontal on the stage. It has been many times in history, uh, in medieval times, for instance, something much more interactive than some of the buildings that we see theatres in uh, mostly suggest. Here a cake is being baked and um, the more you start to collect uh, points, the more nasty the experience also gets a bit. In the beginning it's quite harmonic, but then a certain competition starts to come along. Which is obviously also an important part of the European discussions. In the end, anyway, the machine kind of spits out this paper which shows the division of how much of the cake you get. Um, people often then subvert the rules, which is probably good and which is not probably part of our ways to tackle some of the less meaningful uh, regulations of the European Union. <laughs> picture is taken and then upload it. What I like really about this project is that it has happened already in more than 400 households and some Homes have been private homes where people show off how rich they are. Some people's were students' homes where you needed to sit on the floor. Some are artistic studios. Uh, in Italy, we had shows happening outside the, the in the garden. Um, in uh, Prague, we once had one in a hospital where somebody invited it to be happening in the, around his bed. Uh, in Copenhagen, there was one in a yurta. Uh, very different situations um, that we start to accumulate on our website um, that is um, showing all these so that all, in all these places the piece has already happened um, and if we go into Lisbon So these were the shows happening in Lisbon, about I think about 30 shows maybe. And then you can click into one of them. But it's actually interesting to see that being in Portugal, I always was impressed that in, in the European comparison, uh, if you go back here to the question who thinks there are more European cities than, than citizens of their own country, um, uh, I'll go back there, yeah, Portugal is very clearly not uh, a place where people feel more European than Portuguese behind the mountains, you're kind of more in 
Euro nation. So you see, obviously, it's not a representative um, sociological analysis because we do evaluate results from households where people went to that are cultural goers. Um, so, but still, some things speak for themselves. Um, and then you can click into the households here. So this is one Lisbon household where it has happened. Another one. Different maps come out of this according to how people have behaved. We have to think of this piece in a way of being a, a kind of a decentralized uh, parliament in many, many, many places. It has never happened twice in the same household. Yeah, I think that's about the projects I wanted to talk to that I have done so far. I a bit felt tempted by your lecture before uh, about the replicants to show some images about something that is unfinished that I'm working on right now because I'm actually building uh, in the moment. Uh, well, is it a replicant or not? Is it a... Uh, maybe I show just quickly some images. I'm. I was very impressed um, some years ago when I saw this piece by Polish artist Goszka Makuga um, in a museum. So you think it's a performer sitting there, but it's actually a robot. Um, and even standing three meters in front of him, I thought, oops, uh, is he not maybe tricking me? Is he maybe a person that is pretending to be a robot? So I started to wonder if I could use this in theater, being this place where you are so much hanging on to this, obviously, idea of, of an actor being in front of you, of this liveness, of the fragility of somebody being there, that I said I would like to produce one. And then I met uh, the German author, Thomas Melle, who has become quite known for a book that he has written about his own psychological problem, uh, people are disease that he has been victim of. That's him. And I took a lot of pictures of him and I started to talk about his problem of being so irregular through his disease between manic and depression um, and how an algorithm would feel for him. And he started to write texts about it. And um, the people in Kammerspiele uh, that are re responsible for masks, uh, they are at the moment building his head. So that's how it looked last week. This is silicon. It's kind of a copy from outside of Aptis. Oh, the term is in German. I don't know. These are his hands at the back there. Um, they actually stitch each hair uh, individually. I was really very impressed by their craft. Normally, I'm not somebody that likes theater crafts very much, but. Here he was, but his eyes are missing, and um, so that's what's being produced inside for the head in Berlin, in a small company, the hands. They're designing for the 3D printer in this computer, and these are the eyes that will come where you saw. So my you the animatronic for the arm. Um, and that was... I think the first time that I saw the mouth starting to work. Um, it's scary. Um, I, mean, I started making theater because I loved working with people. And obviously a lot of people are in this, but I think it's theater is often a place where we can try out scary things <laughs> on their way. So I'm at the moment writing this text together with Thomas Melle, and I'm recording it with his voice. And in October, um, there will be this lecture performance. It looks actually, the setup will look just uh, as me here. He will be sitting on, on a chair, and he will be have a little laptop here, and there will be a little screen. He will show some videos, just that it's not him that is there, but his copy. And then we'll ask the question again, is it his memories that are inscribed in him or not? I'll, I'll hopefully be able to tell more in uh, some months. Thank you.